Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. I am Jayshree Hegde, welcoming you all to our first edition of UNS workshop titled How to Achieve Data-Driven Manufacturing, where experts will demonstrate to you live how to integrate data from various industrial data sources into a unified namespace using a real example of a manufacturing process. Now, allow me to introduce you all to our speakers. Kutzai Manditeretsa, Developer Advocate at HiveMQ, Benson Hogland, VP of Marketing and Product Strategy at Opto22, David Schultz, who is Principal Consult Consultant at Spruik, and Jose Noeda, Head of Customer Success and Sales Engineering at Neuron Connectivity Systems. Welcome, Kutzai. Welcome, Benson. Welcome, David. Welcome, Jose. Before we kick off the session, I would like to let you all know that this is a two-hour hands-on workshop and we are recording it. We will share both the recording and slide presentation with you all in a follow-up email. During the session, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. You will find it at the control panel uh, below. Lastly, we'll be running two polls. I request you all to participate. Now, without further ado, I will hand it over to Kutzai and let him and other speakers do a quick round of intro introductions. And I will launch the first poll and run it for about a minute. So over to you, Kutzai. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Jayashree. And uh, thank you so much to the panelists. All right. So and uh, also, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today uh, in this session. So uh, my name is uh, Kutzai Mandi Teresa, and I'm a developer advocate here at uh, Hive MQ. And my role re here really uh, revolves around educating the community around MQTT and uh, Sparkluck and its application uh, in digital transformation uh, projects. Right. So to quickly give you um, uh, a background about Hive MQ. So Hive MQ was founded in 2012 in Landshut, Germany. And uh, our main goal really here is to provide an enterprise data infrastructure that enables companies like in various different uh, verticals to achieve uh, connectivity demands and digital transformation uh, capabilities that are essential to uh, staying competitive in the modern day uh, business environment. And some of our customers include the likes of Audi, BMW, Siemens, Daimler, among many others. And we're also a venture-backed uh, company, having recently raised uh, 43 million uh, euros in seed and Series A uh, funding. Now, our core service offering at Hive MQ is an enterprise MQTT platform, which features an MQTT broker that uh, can connect up to 200 million clients. In fact, we recently did a benchmarking uh, to achieve those figures. Uh, that's thanks to a uh, cluster design for horizontal scalability and uh, redundancy. And the platform also features a control center that allows DevOps administrators to monitor and troubleshoot MQTT client deployments. And, and this control center also exposes a REST API interface, which allows you to build uh, custom apps to uh, manage your MQTT infrastructure. And then in addition, we've got an uh, Hive MQ has got an, a, a flexible extension framework which makes it easy to integrate Hive MQ into uh, a modern uh, microservice architecture. Now, the Hive MQ platform can be self-hosted in third-party third party cloud uh, platforms or Kubernetes cluster. And also we offer a managed cloud service uh, called Hive MQ Cloud, which is what we're going to be using for our demonstration uh, today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Benson to introduce yourself and tell us more about Opto22. Sure. Thanks, Kudzai, and thank you, HiveMQ, for uh, inviting Opta22 to uh, attend this UNS webinar. We're excited to participate. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Opto, uh, we're a decades-long uh, developer and manufacturer of industrial edge systems, which, of course, includes I.O. systems, PLCs, PACs, uh, and IoT gateways. Uh, all of our manufacturing, distribution, sales, and support of all of our products come out of this building I'm in right now, uh, which is our headquarters just north of San Diego, California. And one of the things that kind of sets us apart from you know many other PLCs, edge systems uh, out there is you know we've got 50 years of OT experience combined with uh, a couple of decades of IT technologies and capabilities that we put all into a uh, into a single backplane. And uh, that's really made us suitable for these digital transformation UNS, 
um, type applications that a lot of folks are involved in right now, trying to give a, a combined solution that gets the job done. Our flagship products uh, all belong to what's called the Groove family, uh, including the Groove Epic, uh, Groove Rio, Remote IO, and Groove EMU, which is uh, our energy monitoring unit that supports uh, all these technologies we're about to talk about. And if uh, Kudze, you want to kick the slide. Uh, for this particular presentation, we'll be focusing on the Groove Epic. And the Groove Epic is really, uh, it's not your traditional PLC or HMI or even IPC or Edge Gateway. It's really all of those combined into one, into a single pack, uh, backplane with a lot of tools to be able to manage that very easily all through a web browser uh, and so on. This is a device that's meant to be edge driven, lightweight and report by exception, just as we know is uh, important in these types of applications. It is Linux based, it is a real time controller, so it will run a, a PLC type program. I'll be talking about uh, that program uh, as part of this demonstration. Uh, lots of programming options in there, I'll go through that. Uh, it does have a built in, a web-based HMI that's uh, visible on the front screen externally to an HMI, HDMI monitor or right to your web browser. Lots of software pre-installed. I won't be going through a lot of it, but we will be using Ignition Edge for this particular application. Um, and then indeed, we'll also be using a lot of the gateway functions that are built into the Epic, things like uh, tunneling and uh, VPN tunneling, uh, segmenting, conduits, uh, all kinds of cool stuff there. And, and again, it's really important that when we start looking at these types of solutions, that we have a very cyber secure uh, box doing the job. So we want to prevent bad actors from getting in, but still allow the free flow of uh, OT data to systems that can consume it. So it is cyber secure out of the box with the zero trust model. You got to turn all that stuff on, set up accounts. I'll show you all that when we get to the demo. Thanks, Kudzai. Thanks, Benson. Uh, and then next, Jose, you please introduce yourself and your company. I think you're, you're on, on mute. mute. Yeah. Good day. I'm super excited to be here today in such a good company. I'm Jose Granero, the head of customer success and search engineering and at Neuron Connectivity Systems. Uh, and I have over 20 years of experience of experience in industrial automation and system integration in various verticals, such as food and beverage, pharma, and energy. And uh, in my current role, I work with companies on accelerating their data transformation uh, journey. Uh, let me um, give you a couple of um, tips about um, Neuron. Um, when well, Neuron was founded in uh, 2018 by system integrators after identifying uh, they're always need in, uh, in the market to break down um, operational data silos and make use of uh, this uh, captive data on the platform to enhance productivity and decision making. Uh, we're based in Europe, in, in Madrid, Spain, and currently we offer a product, our flagship product, the Neuron, the industrial edge platform for data ops, which uh, we will be discussing in detail today, and the Fleet Manager, um, comprehensive service uh, that um, that we offer together with our support and maintenance uh, service. And uh, Fleet, Fleet Manager is a service um, that allows our customers to monitor and manage their fleet of nodes in real time from a single uh, secure location. Um, one interesting thing about the uh, Fleet Manager is that it also enables configuring secure tunnels to remotely access any other systems or devices connected to the same network as, as the neural node. So you can, for example, upload um, a program to a remote PLC or a, uh, update the firmware of a variable frequency drive or whatever. I'm very pleased to say that uh, we've got uh, installations in uh, over 50 countries now that uh, have chosen Neuron for their IoT and industrial edge needs. And um, by the way, we have a, a system interior program. And if anyone is interested, uh, you can find the forum on our website and we will reach out uh, to you. And um, since uh, our birth, uh, we've experienced pretty explosive growth with an annual average growth rate uh, that exceeds uh, 50%. Uh, okay, next one, could say please. Uh, well, what's, uh, what's Neuron? Neuron is a complete uh, industrial platform that um, for data ops that enables seamless, seamless integration between the industrial platform and third-party applications either on-premise or in the cloud. 
with, near, with neurons, you can easily create bidirectional data pipelines between OT and IT systems and decouple devices from applications by uh, consolidating, modeling, and processing all your operational data in a, a single source of truth and ultimately making uh, all this data available across the, the entire organization. Uh, Neuron is uh, fully modular. We have 40 modules at the moment, and there are more coming soon, which you can stack as you require to meet your operating needs. Uh, of course, you only need to acquire the modules to really necessary for your, for your application. In the image here, we can see the um, three different sets of modules. On the left-hand side, we have the data acquisition modules. Here we have uh, the typical um, protocols uh, to, to connect to uh, devices and systems uh, in, on the OT side. For example, OPC UA client, Modbus client, Siemens, uh, OPC DA client, et cetera. By the way, there are three modules which fall on uh, two families, MTT client, REST API client, and SQL client. And we also have uh, at the bottom another uh, another set of modules for edge computer and visualization. Yeah, we have, uh, for example, direct tags and scripting, which are two modules uh, that we use to uh, add intelligence to, to, the, to the node. Uh, with direct tags, you can, you can, for example, create a special tax. Um, uh, you can write scripts in Node.js, and the result, the, the output of those scripts is uh, automatically assigned to, to tax in the data model. Or if you need to go one step further, you can use our scripting module to do whatever with the Node.js. You can import external libraries, create your own libraries, etc. In this uh, set of modules, we also have um, other modules for special things, such as Historian, uh, which uses MongoDB database. You can simultaneously store your historical data in a local database, in a remote database, or in both. Um, we also have a, a web, vision, uh, uh, web vision module to create uh, HMI interfaces. And um, Neuron is a cross-platform, well, sorry, finally. And finally, on the, on, the right hand, on the right-hand side, we have the Data delivery modules, which allow us to push all the data, all the data model or, or part of the data model, to uh, other applications or, or systems. Yet we have uh, Spark Plug, MPT client, OPC UA server, REST API server, etc. Okay, and um, Neuron is a cross-platform. I mean, it can run on uh, most versions of uh, Windows and Linux distributions, as well as on ARM architectures such as Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have an unlimited licensing model. It is unlimited in tax, users, devices, and connections for an affordable price. Um, once installed, all you need to access the node is uh, our browser, nothing else. And um, you can install it in uh, less than a minute. And the development environment, uh, Web, Web UI, allows you to create your data model very quickly, especially if you use the templates, uh, as we were going to see in a, in a few minutes. Uh, it's uh, extremely efficient. A single node can easily manage several hundred thousand tags. It is uh, also very efficient in terms of uh, hardware requirements. Um, you can start with something as low as uh, one CPU with only one core at uh, one gigahertz with uh, one gigabyte of RAM and one gigabyte of hard disk space. Uh, with a Raspberry Pi 4, for example, you can uh, manage around 5,000 tags. And uh, from its inception, uh, Neuron was conceived to seamlessly deploy distributed architectures with several hundred of thousand uh, nodes. Um, you can connect uh, nodes to each other in uh, in a matter of minutes, uh, aggregating, uh, for example, all the data coming from your remote assets in a central node using neuron links, and uh, scale your architecture very easily. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Neuron is like a Swiss Army knife that has everything you need to address any IoT project, uh, no matter what the requirements are. And that's it. I turn it over to you, David. Okay. Thank you, Jose. David? No, thank you. That's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed to be here. Um, always great to be included in the webinars of uh, HiveMQ, uh, the, the events that you do. Um, you know, one thing you didn't mention, Jose, you can actually run Neuron right on the uh, Opto22 on the Epic. So I actually have that, mm -hmm. that use case yeah. running here. So um, you right. know, they, it can run a lot of places, very scalable. So yeah, a little bit about Spruik. So as uh, I mentioned, I am the uh, principal consultant for Spruik Technologies. And while we are a fairly young company, there are decades of experience uh, of the people that are part of the organization. Um, as it says there, it was started in 2017. 
really wanted to take a look at a lot of the new technology. And what I mean by that is we didn't want to just to go in as a, a, a traditional systems integrator and upgrade all the software that's there. We really wanted to take a look at what are some of the emerging technologies? What are the things that IT is doing that we can bring to the OT level? So this new technology is looking at open source. So things like MQTT brokers or um, InfluxDB for time series data, um, Grafana. Uh, we also want to use uh, you know, container technologies like um, either Docker or Kubernetes containers. Um, we also want to look uh, at uh, Apollo Federation services so we can uh, manage and scale um, with a lot of open technology that is it's fully managed uh, remotely. So that's the whole you know, modern technology that we want to deploy uh, within a, a, the manufacturing level. Um, we have offices that we're all remote employees, but we have uh, people that are all over the world. And that means we've seen a lot of applications. We've run into a lot of uh, challenging problems that needed to be solved. So we can leverage all that experience across uh, world areas. It also means that any of the projects that we do, we can support at an enterprise level. You don't have to worry about a, you know, an eight to five U.S. Um, you know, American support, you'll have 24 by seven with people in various uh, world areas uh, throughout that. And of course, we're experts in consulting and implementation. You know, our, you know, my whole mission is to help manufacturers develop and execute strategies for their digital transformation and uh, asset performance uh, uh, efforts. And that's certainly something that is uh, it, it's core to what it is we do at Spruik Technologies. You know, we, we're, we're there to help lead manufacturers through their digital transformation process and deploying all the great technologies that can be associated with that, uh, with people that are providing support um, all over the world. So that's Spruik. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Okay, so now before we jump into uh, our overall architecture for the demo that we're going to be uh, showing you and also like kind of like going into the demo, I believe it's important to kind of like first talk about why manufacturers need to adopt the unified namespace for their digital transformation strategies. And uh, for that, uh, I would like to uh, invite David to give us a breakdown of why the unified namespace. David, sure. back so, to you again. yeah. Oh, no, thank you. So, you know, by definition, the unified namespace is the single source of truth for all your data and events that are within your manufacturing process. And it also follows the structure of the overall business. And people will think of a, a UNS as it's just all of our edge data that's been, you know, put into these uh, asset models, if you will. And, you know, that's partly true. The entire intent here is to bring together these semantic data models that we're not just looking at raw values that have no context and no meaning. We want to bring those together and compile those and package them up. And so sometimes they're thought of as a UDT. So instead of having, say, a bunch of, of disparate compressor tags, we actually model a compressor. And people usually understand, yeah, I got the asset, I got the equipment or, you know, this edge data um, that is produced by that. But a unified namespace also means that we need to add context. So we'll get into some functional namespaces. So the functional namespace, the idea is that it's more of a, it's a transactional data. It's an event that occurred. Um, what we'll be looking at in the demo is a functional namespace of an overall equipment effectiveness, an OEE value that is capturing edge data. It's um, performing a calculation on that data. And then it's presenting the overall, you know, what's the process health that's happening on my particular, um, you know, particular line right now. So, you know, that, that's an example of a functional namespace or a material movement or a, a downtime event with a, um, a, a maintenance work order that's associated with it. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about a, a hierarchical uh, namespace. So within the hierarchy of the business, and we've uh, a unified namespace generally follows the ISA 95 standard of enterprise site area line cell, we'll have a, a line namespace or a cell namespace that is comprised of these edge namespaces and these functional namespaces. And the idea is that we want to, it's the, it's the tension between data governance of this is the thing you have to have versus the types of things you can have. And we want to ensure that we're supporting common data models throughout the organization while giving a little bit of flexibility it's in there. Um, and then finally, there is a, an, um, an informative namespace or informational namespace. And that's all about, you know, the goal is to get the right information in the right time with the right people in the right format. Well, this um, informative uh, namespace helps um, capture that information. So based on your role, based on an event, 
based on where you are in your process, we're going to have a common uh, data structure so that visualization you can easily ascertain and, and solve a problem. So when you bring all of this information together, you have a fully contextualized business operation that you can look at in real time and answer questions like, what's running on line one at this particular plant? What's its overall health? Is it in a downtime event? Is there an active uh, maintenance uh, work order that's associated with that? And it gives you that real time status and a common data model so that you can analyze all this information in real time and start making um, decisions with that. So that's the whole purpose of a unified namespace. It's, it's the combination of, of those uh, data models and uh, namespace models that I was just describing. Okay, thank you so much, uh, David. Yeah, so now I think we can now start kind of like talking about all the different components that we're going to be uh, integrating uh, for this demo. So what we'll be demonstrating to you today is uh, an implementation of a unified namespace solution for tracking the overall equipment effectiveness, right, of a manufacturing enterprise with uh, multiple production sites. And as an example, we're simulating uh, two bottling plants, right? So we've got two bottling processes, one running on up to 22 equipment in California, which is where Benson is located. And another one is running on the neuron platform in Madrid, which is uh, also where uh, Jose is located. Now, the process data from these two uh, sources is going to be published to the Hive MQ Cloud MQTT broker, where the uh, unified namespace is uh, sort of like represented. And then on the other end, we're going to have a David who's running a SEPASoft manufacturing execution uh, system on the Ignition platform, where he will be consuming data from the unified namespace, creating work orders, calculating OEE, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and then pushing that data back into the unified namespace. So to 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 proceed here, I would let David tell us more uh, about what he's going to be demonstrating on the SepaSoft MES platform. Sure. So on the left side here, there is some edge data that's coming in, and it, later on in this webinar, um, both Jose and Benson will be demonstrating what information that they are capturing at the edge they will be modeling that information so it comes through it, it so it's it's published as a semantic data model of a manufacturing process and publishing that information into the cloud from there i will be on my end consuming that edge information and i will be starting and stopping production orders i will be um, calculating the overall equipment effectiveness of um, the, those processes of those lines that are running. And then I will publish an enterprise namespace back to that broker that'll include the information, the edge data, as well as this, uh, this functional namespace as a, um, as a complete enterprise. You know, it, it's a very basic, but part of a, an enterprise uh, unified namespace, bringing through all the, the information um, that's sitting out at the plants and putting it all so that, that your information is delivered, you know, with the context that it needs in order to be effective. Awesome. Uh, so, Jose, can you give us a breakdown of what your part of the demo is going to uh, include? Sure. Uh, okay. So you could say, well, first, uh, let's see why Neuron is so well suited for a unified space architecture. Okay. Um, Neuron is uh, designed to be deployed as close to the data source as possible, which is one of the premises of the unified space concept. And um, it's uh, extremely well fitted for the industrial environment and can change data with a variety of systems, such as POCs, SCADA, uh, historians, uh, MES, uh, distributed control systems, uh, databases, just to name a few. Um, uh, it lets you build your data model using proper normalization and simple aggregation techniques. So you can uh, build a consistent and standardized data models. Uh, you can replicate uh, anywhere using templates, as we will see later on. And uh, the, the, the data model uh, can contain real-time data coming from many different data sources, hybrid data, and also metadata, of course. Um, the, the Neuron platform uh, includes uh, two modules, uh, MQTT and Sparkplug client. Uh, both uh, protocols are lightweight and use report by exception, which are other two premises of the of the unified space. And um, sometimes Sparkplug is not uh, well suited for some use cases. So 
And for those cases, we can still use uh, the MQTT client to customize our payloads and data parsers, uh, depending depending on uh, whether we're publishing or pulling data from, from the unified in this space. Um, the platform also includes uh, other delivery modules, okay, as I mentioned before. Uh, so you can also neuron uh, to subscribe to the, to the broker, uh, to go to the broker and uh, pull data out of the of the unifying space and deliver it uh, to systems that don't support MQTT or Sparplug, for example, using REST API server or CQL or an OPC or OPC UA server. Uh, finally, uh, Neuron is uh, built on modern technologies and uses open standards from an industry 4.0 viewpoint. Uh, digital transformation cannot rely on closed solutions or those from a single uh, manufacturer. And an open architecture is necessary to ensure scalability and uh, compatibility with future projects uh, and expansions. And next one could say, please. And um, well, this, uh, this slide um, depicts pretty well what, uh, what uh, Neuron is. Many IoT projects uh, aren't scaling because uh, of data interoperability issues, and, and that's precisely where uh, Neuron comes in. Because basically, what it does is that uh, it's just to uh, enable data interoperability and uh, and data governance. And uh, next one, please. Okay, this is the architecture we are going to to use uh, in today's demo. Okay. Um, on the left-hand side, we, we have uh, three different manufacturing cells that make up the line. We have, we're have we going to connect to the, uh, to the filler through OPC GUI client, to the labeler with a Siemens client module, and finally to the packer with Modbus client over, over TCP. And uh, we will also uh, be using derived tags to make some calculations, uh, for example, to add all the, the rejects uh, throughout the, the production line. And then we will uh, eventually uh, publish all, uh, all this data to ignition using the, the Spark Plug client module. So in summary, we're going to, to use five uh, different uh, modules for this for this demo. And uh, that's it. I turn it over to you, I could say. Thank you, Jose. And then Benson, can you break down what your part of the demo is going to include? Sure. So uh, as you can see there in the middle of the screen, you've got your uh, Groove Epic uh, represented. And in the bubble above it is a lot of different software, of course, that uh, allows you to achieve different um, tasks and solve different problems based on what your application is. Uh, and downstream from there, you can see I can connect to you know various I.O., uh, analog, digital, serial, CAN, you name it. Uh, that can all be brought in through various I.O. modules if you choose to use it that way. Uh, but we do have some customers that use Epic without any I.O. modules simply as an edge gateway. Uh, and in that case, we could communicate uh, like Neuron Software. We'll use Ignition to communicate to other devices. My particular demo, I'm going to keep this really simple. I've got a bottling line program that's running inside the Epic. We're going to uh, show how we're going to use Ignition to create the unified namespace. In a sense, the uh, the tags on a given namespace that I'll then use to publish up to uh, there on the top line. You can see the Hive MQ cloud. Uh, up there, we've also got VPN uh, connectivity on this device as well. Anytime we're communicating upstream, out through a, a, a gateway of some sort to reach other networks, we want to do that on its own network interface. So I'll be showing you that as well. Uh, and then downstream, uh, that is on a protected OT network so that uh, we're effectively segmenting uh, those two networks from each other. Uh, so we're able to capture all the real-time OT data, bring it in, model the data in any way we want, and then send it on its way up to the HiveMQ broker to be, uh, again, participants in the unified namespace. I'll also show you a little bit about how, you know, a quick little HMI for the operator that's directly on the Epic as, uh, as well. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other tools there we won't be getting into. Primarily, we're going to keep this pretty, uh, pretty simple from my standpoint. Thanks, Kuzai. Okay, thank you, Benson. Okay, so I believe now it's time to jump into the demo, which I'm sure the majority of you really have been patiently waiting for. <laughs> right, so um, we're going to start off by setting up the, the, the broker, which uh, uh, um, uh, the, the other components are going to be pushing information to. So as I explained um, uh, previously, what we're going to be using uh, for the MQTT broker, for the Hive MQ broker, is the Hive MQ Cloud. So you could deploy this on a uh, on an Azure or, or, or private cloud, 
But for today's demo, we're going to use this managed service called Hive MQ Cloud. So this is uh, a free service, right? Which you can actually connect up to a hundred uh, devices. So you can sign up uh, with no uh, credit card at all and connect up to a hundred devices. And then there's a table there that shows you all the different um, um, options that you get out of that. So to sign up for this, pretty simple. You just go to try out for free. Um, so when you do that for the first time, because I've already got an account, so it will take me straight to the portal. But when you do it for the first time, you're just going to have to put your email, confirm your email. And then as soon as you do that, it will take you to the uh, portal where you just need to select uh, uh, the cloud host, whether it's Azure or AWS. And then when you uh, let into the portal, all of the cluster, the, the, that uh, primary cluster is already created for you. So all you need to do is just to uh, configure the cluster. So for example, this is the cluster that we have here. So if I go into manage cluster, you can see all of this information about this uh, broker cluster. We've got a broker URL address here, right? And then the port number 8883. So this is an encrypted connection. So which means all of the clients here can uh, uh, communicate uh, with this broker via an encrypted channel. So you know your data is always uh, protected. And then you've got an access management uh, tab here, which allows you to create all the uh, clients that are allowed to uh, connect to this broker. And then the other thing, which is not really part of this demo today, is we've got uh, uh, integrations, which is Kafka integration. Just for interest sake, this is something that you could use to extend your unified namespace because your unified namespace gives you like a snapshot of your of your of, of, of your uh, kind of like uh, production. But when you need to like persist that information, retain that data for consumption at a later date, this is where you need to kind of like bring in a Kafka platform, which retains that data for you and then allows all the other enterprise applications to consume off of that. So uh, as mentioned, I've already created this broker cluster and then I've shared these details with um, uh, uh, the, the, the panelists here. So they are going to be using this broker to uh, create this unified namespace. So uh, without uh, further more to do, I will turn it over to you. Uh, let's see, uh, Benson. Oh. Right. So let's go. Okay, y'all should see, uh, see my screen there. Um, we get a thumbs up, terrific. Okay, first things first, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the demo itself. So I'm gonna reverse my screen. Uh, screen here. Everything I'm going to be showing you today is running on this Epic. There are no external gateways, external PCs, or anything that's required. Everything is running right here. And as you can see, I've got an Epic with a four-channel uh, backplane here. Uh, this backplane has got some digital cards in it, input card, digital output card, and one of our multi-function software configurable cards for analog, digital, ins or outs, whatever you like. All of those are wired to this backplane here. So I've got a temperature probe. I've got a little knob here that's gonna simulate my bottling line speed. I've got some other buttons I can interact with. And then I've got an external system here. It's just a couple of push buttons wired into some digital inputs over here. And I can use those to start the run, to reset the run or to set a, uh, a reject. Uh, all that information is obviously coming into here where on my Epic processor, I've got my two ethernet cables, one that's connected to the corporate LAN so I can reach the HiveMQ broker over that encrypted channel and the other communicating to the uh, OT network. Now, the other thing that uh, you can probably see here is we've got a built-in HMI. So in here I can, uh, this screen uh, currently is for downtime status, but uh, this allows the operator to interact with the system, but you can also completely configure the system from this screen as well. I'll be doing it from a browser just because it's easier to do. Uh, it does have an HDMI port on it, so I can actually take this out and I've got another Epic behind me connected to an HDMI monitor over my uh, shoulder here. So you can certainly extend the HMI outside or again, access any of this from a, um, from a web browser, which is what I'm gonna do right now. So I'm gonna switch this back and you can see I've got my Chrome browser up. So the first thing I need to do is log into this device and it has a host name just as you would expect from any server. So I would go Epic LC2 Docs is the name of my Epic. And when I come to the first page, I am connected securely. I know because I have the padlock up there in my, uh, in my browser. So I have an encrypted connection, which is important. 
And that means now that as I enter in my username and password, I know I'm not doing that open on a, some network where somebody could sniff my password. So I'll go ahead and sign in with my administrator account. And indeed, I am now logged into this Epic, and this is where I manage the device. Now, I'm going to try to keep this as focused as possible on the demo at hand. There's a lot of capability in this system, way more than we can possibly cover in the short time I have. So let me co cover some of the very basics. The first one is accounts. So this is where I set up the local user accounts on the device. And I did log in with the Opto uh, username and password, but you can see I can create other accounts for the operator. Uh, even David Schultz, uh, I have a, an account for him so he can remote into my device uh, if he needed to do so with the proper authentication over VPN. Um, there's also uh, LDAP in here, and that simply means that if you wanna use Active Directory, uh, or uh, another LDAP uh, type system to manage the users on this device, you absolutely can. So that's all built in uh, as well. Now, as I said earlier, security is absolutely paramount. So we wanna make sure that this device is uh, encrypted, the authentication with the users, and also importantly, the firewall. Because when I'm sending this data out to HiveMQ, I'm going outbound over the corporate network here to reach the cloud. But indeed, I have no firewall parts open on the way in. I want to make sure that I don't allow any bad actors into this system. Uh, so I've got to I lock down all of those ports. I only uh, communicate outbound. Um, and the firewall works on all network interfaces. So I can set up firewall rules for each network interface. And real quickly, what our network looks like currently on this epic is, as I said, I've got one Ethernet connection that's connected to a static network, my OT network another ethernet connection that's connected to the corporate LAN so I can reach other networks. And finally, the open VPN tunnel. The Epic has an open VPN client built in. So once I put in the credentials for the server, I can then connect and this device can be assess, accessed from anywhere in the world. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this thing. Indeed, it is a controller. Uh, so first and foremost, it is a real-time PLC. And unlike many other applications out there or edge devices, we do give you a choice of programming languages, our own pack control, which we've had for 30 years, uh, or uh, CodeSys and IEC 61131-3 development environment or IDE. So if you want to you know, program in ladder or function block diagram and all of the languages that are supported by IEC, you can do so. I happen to be pretty familiar with pack control, so I am using that in this particular case. Uh, and this is just an interface that gives me a status of the pack control program that's running on there. So what does it look like? Well, I'll bring up another screen here and that's it there. This is free software as well, download from the Opto22 website. And I developed the bottom line application uh, in this guy with just various flow charts. Uh, and inside uh, you can put in script, you can just use uh, condition blocks and action blocks. Uh, as well, but in this case, I'm just using the um, uh, some of the scripting here. And over on the right side, this is where I've configured all my I/O. So I've got my LED backplane in here. I've got some push buttons. I've got my potentiometer, as I described. These are all the I/O points I want to use to build my application. And then I have a lot of numeric variables in there. So these are, of course, you know, the result of uh, inputs coming in or maybe outputs. But more importantly, the data I ultimately want to send up to David and the UNS. And then I can go into debugger and uh, do a quick uh, look at what's going on in there. And uh, the debugger just shows me all these various statuses, where we're at. So I got a real time view uh, and I can even, you know, go in there and uh, auto step through some of these blocks to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and they are. So we've got this all squared away already. Uh, just a quick peek into the programming language for the bottling line. So now that that's done and once it's been created and downloaded into the Epic, it'll run forever. Um, now, the next step is, well, how do we get the data out of the pack control program and on its way up to the UNS? So let's uh, swing back over to my uh, main Groove Manage screen. And I've got a little, a lot of different options here. But for my uh, particular demo, I will be using Ignition. And I'll use Ignition to model up that data appropriately for the UNS. So in this case, uh, I want to get you know, data from pack control into Ignition. There's a couple of ways to do that. The way I'm doing it is with OPC UA. So this does have a built-in OPC UA server. So it's taking all those tags from the pack control program, making them available via OPC. That's the method I'll use from Ignition to pull all the data in. You'll also notice that there's MQTT here as well. 
and it is built in, it's native. Um, however, because I wanna do some modeling of the data, I'm electing to use Ignition for that, but uh, native MQTT is also supported both Spark plug and string payloads. So OPC, MQTT, Modbus, there's all kinds of different ways to get data out of this uh, device, including RESTful API, as I saw in the comments. Okay, so now that we've got that all set up, um, now I wanna go into Ignition. So indeed, Ignition is running on this platform, just as I now understand Neuron can run on this platform. In this case, we've built a nice interface to be able to get into Ignition. I can run Ignition Edge or full Ignition, your choice, depending on what your application requirements are. I'll go ahead and log in and show you just a couple of settings here in the gateway uh, that are required for this application. So again, everything is secure. So I have to log in with a username and password. And in here, this is where I'm on the configuration pages. A couple of quick things. Number one, OPC connections. I told you I spun up the OPC OA server to get all the pack control tags. This is the configuration to talk to that OP, OPC OA server, all local host. So this is all happening right on the Epic, not, not going to an external device or anything like that. So now that we have all the tags in, uh, I can pull all those in and start doing some interesting things with them. Now, the other thing that uh, you know, Ignition is really good for, as is uh, Neuron, is this notion of connecting to other devices. So if I just switch this real quick over my shoulder, I've got some Siemens and Allen Bradley PLCs and so on, but I'm keeping mine simple. So I won't be pulling in some of the other uh, PLC data for my demo. Uh, Jose will uh, show you that using the Neuron software. So the final configuration, and I'll switch back, is down here, uh, MQTT transmission. What is that? MQT transmission is a module that fits inside the Ignition uh, ecosystem, and its purpose is an MQTT Spark Plug B client. So I've already showed you another MQTT client, and there are plenty to choose from on Epic. But in this case, we're going to use the uh, MQTT transmission uh, module, and indeed, the setup for that's pretty straightforward. You probably remember that uh, cluster URL that, hi that uh, Kudzai mentioned earlier. I have that in there along with my username and password. And I've uh, established a connection over that uh, outbound port through my uh, network gateway here at uh, Opto22. And now I can reach and I've connected securely and encrypted to the HiveMQ broker. So that's pretty much all the settings you need to do in the main Ignition Edge gateway. The final part is how do we take those pack control tags that I described earlier and formulate them into a way that I can publish that data to the UNS? So for that, we'll use. Go ahead and question. So, so, Benson, maybe before you go into that, there's a, a question here that uh, maybe is more related to what you are showing here. So, um, uh, Savita uh, is, is actually asking, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name okay. Uh, can MQTT be natively used in Groove with codices without going through Ignition? Yes, it can. There's a, a number of ways to do that. Uh, what most of our customers uh, end up doing is they use the libraries that are available from the CodeSys store, which does have MQTT Spark Plug B, and then you integrate that directly into your CodeSys program. That's one method. There's there's several, but that's that's one method. You, you don't need to use Ignition for that. Perfect. Terrific. All right, so uh, thank you for that question. We'll jump into the designer. That's up on the screen now. So the designer is just a software that runs on a PC that's, you know, comes from the Epic, loads into your PC and allows me to start developing my application from a UNS modeling perspective. First thing is I bring in all of my pack control tags. So now I have them all here. There's everything, all, everything is in real time. And this is from that OPC UA server. But I don't want to send all of this data to the UNS because there's a lot of data that most people don't need. So we've defined what the UNS is, what the namespace looks like. And so what I do is I simply create another folder here at the top called MQTT tags. And in there is where I've defined my topic namespace. So my group ID is California. My edge node ID is line one and my device ID is bottler. And then what I've done is I've simply dragged those appropriate tags up into here, uh, given the right namespace and the right tag names and once that's configured, I simply hit the button and I start transmitting on change anything that's happening from this system. There's no need for anybody from the outside to come and connect to my system. I can do it all from here and send it on its way. Now, one quick note, I did uh, do this very simply. In other words, I've taken the pack control tags, put them into an MQTT namespace and sent them on their way. But indeed, I could do the same with UDTs. 
If I had multiple bottling lines that uh, had a lot of similarities, I would probably, I, in fact, that's what I usually do, is create a UDT and have that, uh, um, that data sent up. But we're keeping it simple here, uh, quickly get tags, put them into tag folders and publish that data. So this is great for, you know, now David has a real-time access to this uh, information flowing through the broker, all report by exception, all edge driven, and 100% encrypted and secure. But what about the operator? So I showed you quickly down here on my screen, I've got an operator interface, but I've also got one that I can just access from my browser. And I'll go into GrooveView, and GrooveView is just a built-in web-based HMI, not meant to be SCADA or anything, but a nice you know, operator interface that allows me to, you know, start the process, do whatever I need. I'm going to come down to this page here. It's my bottler production overview. I can see what my current stats are, what my line uh, bottles per minute are, the state and so on. And I can also enter in some data for how much I want to, you know, what my production might, might be. And that data is now also just sent to David because I changed it. Um, and then the other important thing is if there is a downtime event. So I have a button here that's gonna simulate a downtime event. I press it, the back plane turns red, as you can see there, uh, and then I can enter in a, a downtime reason. It could be maintenance. This is also sent up to David so that he knows that he can't send a production run down to me because I'm in maintenance, I'm in a downtime status. And uh, a real quick way for the operator to enter that information. Once we've cleared the maintenance, I'll take it back off. And now David will get the uh, message that I'm no longer in a down, downtime status, and he can start sending me some uh, some production runs. So that's kind of all it in a, in, a, in a nutshell. We've got the Epic with its IO, a control program running, OPC UA into ignition, model up the data, and send it up on change to the Hive MQ broker for ingestion by just about any kind any software that supports Sparkplug B. And in this case. That's going to be David. So he's going to start consuming all this data, all this data, and he'll be able to auto discover it. I don't have to send him my tag names or anything like that. It'll just pop into his system uh, for building his application. So with that, I'll uh, stop my share. Thank you, Benson. Um, Jose, would you like to show us your part of the demo? You're on mute, Jose. Let me share my screen. While he's getting ready, there was a question that popped up about Sparkplug. Both versions 2.2 and 3.0 are supported. Yes, both are supported. Uh, well, first, I'm going to start here from my site uh, showing how Neuron can be installed. I do already have a Neuron installed, but it's incredible, incredibly easy hey, to go to our website. and. Um, uh, in uh, you have this uh, big da download Neuron uh, button on, on the top on, on every page, which uh, takes you to the to the download uh, page. Okay, you can uh, download Neuron for whatever operating system. It comes um, with a um, two-hour trial period, which can be restarted uh, any number of times. So you can fully evaluate uh, all of that we're showing here today and get a proof concept without having to buy an analysis. Uh, installations, uh, installation takes less than a minute, and once it's done, the web user interface automatically opens up in, in your web browser. Neuron is uh, extremely light. It's, uh, it's only, this is the Windows uh, setup, the Windows installer. And um, for example, this one is only 38.9 megabytes, okay? And uh, we recommend uh, installing the, the whole package. Um now I'm going to access a I'm going to move this over here. Thank you. I'm going to access um a remote node where I'm going to start configuring everything from scratch To access uh, web UI, I only need uh, my, my web browser. This is the web user interface where everything is configured in, in Neuron. It's, uh, as you can see, it's uh, pretty clean and intuitive. And the first thing you typically use uh, when started to configure Ignition is to create a new, uh, a new module. Since we have to uh, connect to the um, OPC UI server that is providing the data for the pillar, let's start 
by creating a new OPC UA client module here. Now, uh, let's select the functionality of the module in the drawdown menu. Okay. We need to save the logger and API configuration sections for the module. Sure. And uh, once I created uh, the module instance, I can start creating the, the connection to the to the OPC UA server. So let's create a, a new connection. Let's name it, for example, filler. And uh, here in the endpoint URL, I need to type in the IP address or URL of the OPC UA server. This case is 10, 101, or 23, and the port is 605. And within this button here, it should offer me the available endpoints. I'm going to select the, the, the only available endpoint. Okay, I'm going to check the configuration. And um, now uh, I'm connected to the to the OPC UA server, but uh, I still, uh, since I using a um, Siren Encrypt security mode, I need to trust the certificate the server has just uh, sent. And I need to do the same on the, on the server side, sorry, for the certificate. My note is uh, sending to it. And once I do it, I can, for example, browse, select here my, my connection and I start browsing uh, all the data available in, in, this, uh, in this server. Once I've created the connection, uh, the next step is to start creating tags. So I click here on tags. I can, uh, for example, create a new group. I'm going to name it filler. And uh, I'm going to create a new tag. In your own, everything is configured at the tag level. So for example, um, I'm going to create a tag name infit, which is going to be a number, a number that is going to be a number, uh, in particular, an integer. And the third one is uh, what determines when a new event is going to be generated. Here we can uh, also define whether this tag is uh, going to have right permissions or not. Uh, we can also select in this drop-down menu on the uh, persistency mode. It can be uh, can have persistency in memory. So in case the, um, the uh, module uh, or the node is restarted, the values uh, are going to persist. And uh, or uh, this, uh, this this persistence, which is ideal, for example, for a set point or something like that. We can also add some details here to this tag. For example, you know, fill our in fit or something, engineering units, if they apply, and also uh, default value in case we don't use uh, any persistency mode here. Um, and this is probably the most important section where we have to define uh, the data source where these uh, tag values are, are coming from, the tag values come from, okay? So near again, here again, I need to select the functionality of uh, my module, OPC UA client. The name of the instance I created previously, because I, I can have several in different instances, okay? And the name of the, of the connection. I just filler, okay? Once I, I do this, I can use this browser and select my tag. Uh, right now, it's not possible to drag and drop the tags to the, to the model directly, but uh, from version 1.21.5, 1 uh, this functionality is going to be available. Okay, so it would be much easier for, for users to, to start using the, the OPC UA tags in the data model. And so I am going to select, for example, here filler, and we have set in fit, okay, select it here. And um, well, this is the scan rate, the sampling time, five seconds, it's going to be uh, about every five seconds, it's okay. If we have a, we want to store historical values, I can do it also here. Here I would uh, enable that possibility and point to one or several different historian instances installed whether locally or remotely or both. And I can also uh, configure as many alarms as needed down here in case I, I want to use them. 
let's keep it simple for the time being and save the changes. So um, if I, now I want, if, if I want to check that everything's configured properly or I have to do is come here to real time and I can see my, my tag displaying with a uh, good quality. So I could keep on working the same way, for example, uh, duplicate this tag here and say that is the outfit. Sorry, yeah, but typo here. And manually change the node ID now here. Okay, and the same if I go to real time. Something's wrong, well, I'm not going to do it manually. Okay, here it is. And uh, I could uh, keep on working the same way, but, uh, or another another uh, way to work also is uh, to export this to a CSV file and configure everything in that CSV file and import it back to Neuron one, once you're done. But given that we're going to have as uh, different lines and that we're going to have more than one filler, it makes sense to start working with templates. So to do that, I can drag and drop the filler to the templates, uh, to the templates panel. Okay, and I'm going to create a new custom property. Example, I'm going to line, which is one, going to be a, a text. Uh, it's going to have a, a text type because I'm only going to use it to bring the um, um, an expression in, in the node ID field. So if I come here to use that. Uh, custom property in the note out note uh, ID field. I must add an equal double quotes because this is a string here plus and now to use um, to use the custom properties uh, this uh, must be between curly brackets so I'm going to add a curly bracket here and uh, the name of the custom property line curly bracket again I'm going to remove this one quotes, unquotes, okay? I'm going to copy this one here and do the same for the outfit. So now if I delete the group I created previously, I now if I right click here, I can select a filler to create a new instance of that template. By the way, templates follow um, the ob uh, object ramen paradigms, uh, paradigm in terms of inheritance. So any changes you make to a template are going to be automatically inherited by all the instances of that template. So I limit filler. I'm going to assign uh, value to this custom property, which is one. And if I come back to real time, it's, here it is, it's working. And um, I can also embed um, a template within another and uh, the value of a custom property can be inherited from an upper entity in the, in the hierarchy. That's what I'm going to do. For example, given the, that the feeder is going to belong to a line, I'm going to create, um, Align with a custom property. I'm going to give it the same name, line. And here in, in tax, what I'm going to do is to uh, create an instance of the, of the filler. And instead of assigning a, a value to this custom property, what I'm going to do is to point it to the uh, uh, custom property of the, of the line. So I'm going to add an equal curly bracket and the name of the custom property I've used for the line, okay? So I'm going to save it, delete it. And if now I create a line, give it an 
body to the custom property here, it should be working too. Here it is. So this is the recommended way to work uh, in your own when you have to create uh, many different uh, instances of, if you have to, to create uh, something at least twice, use templates. So we put it here, we would have the align two, okay. I'm going to change custom property. And here's the, the line two. And if we had to create many, many instances, again, we can export this uh, to a CSV file, create all those, those instances with the custom property values, uh, they must have, and, and we can import it back to, to Neuron and have all the data model created. Um, to connect to the, to the labeler, we would do uh, the, the same. We would create a, a Modbus client module. Again, we would select the functionality of the module right here. Okay, the changes and the configuration is uh, in Europe is very similar, regardless of the of the modules. Of course, there are. It depends on the on the technology you are using, but it's uh, uh, very similar. We would create again the connection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. By the way, ignition and then. Neuron provides a, a contextual help, uh, which um, gives you very useful tips. Uh, all we have to do is to expand it down here. And um, once, uh, let's suppose I've already created the connections to uh, the three uh, manufacturing cells in my, in my line. Now I could uh, also create a direct tax module. I'm going to name it derived. I need to save the default logger and API configuration. And with DLIFE, I can start creating uh, other type of, uh, of tags. So for example, if I want to calculate the addition of this, um, let's create it here. If I want to add, uh, Two different values coming from two different tags. I need to set the module type again, derived tags, the name of the instance, derived. And here you can select uh, the type of, of tag. In this case, it's going to be an expression tag because it's going to be the result of a script written using Node.js. The output contains. Um, the value, uh, timestamp, and um, the quality of the DAG. And here I can, sorry, I can down here. I need to add all the tags I'm going to to use in the in the script. So, for example, if I'm going to use the line one in fit, I can use uh, an alias here. Select the tag path for this alias. Which, for example, if this one. This one for thank you. Okay. And uh, I can write my expression using not yes. In this way, put in a minute. Input in input one, input two, okay. And it's in capital letters for the uh, So, and this way I can create um, 
simple or more complex uh, expression tags. Um, let's imagine that uh, we have already created our, our data model. The, the next thing uh, we should do is to create a Sparkplug client instance to push all this data to, um, to the hyphen Q to ignition, to the hyphen Q broker. So I need to create a Sparkplug client instance. Again, it's always the same. Now here I have to define the, um, the, the topic definition, as I mentioned some before. So for example, I can use Madrid for the, for the group. Here I have the H node, which is going to be Botrin. Oh, no, sorry, line one, see, right as smart. And uh, here I can select whether I'm going to use Spark Plug, uh, version two or version three. And uh, start adding as many as many clients, as many brokers as uh, I have in my architecture, providing I have a redundant redundant broker. So, for example, I'm going to here MQTT broker one. I'm going to enter the URL port. Uh, the client ID is uh, usually assigned automatically. Uh, the um, authentication mode we're going to use. And uh, in, in case I have several brokers here, what uh, the client is going to do is to um, go over that list in, in case it can connect to the first broker. It's going to try to connect to the second one. And if it couldn't connect to any brokers, it would start, uh, it would uh, initiate the start, the start and forward mechanism and um, to start um, storing locally all the all the data in order to prevent any data loss. And uh, Sparkplug also provides an important functionality, which is the primary host, because um, it allows to detect um, um, it's, um, the client can also um, detect whether the primary application is connected or not to the to the brokers. And in case the, we enable it. If the, it it would do exactly the same, it would start uh, uh, if the the primary application loses connection to the broker, the clients would start uh, storing uh, the data locally until uh, this uh, the connection the communication would uh, would be restored. And we can store and we can enable or disable uh, or disable the storm forward mechanism at a new device. and uh, filter the, the data we want to publish. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to jump to another node which where we have already created the, the whole uh, data model. Okay, here we have Modbus client, OPC client, clients, MS client, we have all our tags here. Okay, 74 tags with uh, all our machines and the two lines. And uh, in the Sparkplug client configuration, we have group name Madrid, line one, line two, and also the bottler. And we are publishing absolutely everything to FNQ, to could say it's a FNQ broker. Okay, so if I open, for example, ignition, uh, my local ignition gateway, which is also subscribed to the to the broker, I can see how California is pushing all all the, the data as well as we from Madrid for line one and line two. And uh, finally, I wanted to show you uh, something else. Uh, with uh, our module web vision, you can also create a very simple uh, uh, HMIs. Uh, it's fully web-based, uh, like a uh, web UI. So I'm going to open it here.
for example, I can uh, start my line from here. I should say, not here, but here. Okay, how? It's already started my, my line number two. And that's it. I hand it over to you, could say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, so uh, maybe let's kind of like bring it all together now uh, with uh, David, uh, if you could uh, show us your part of the demo. And while David gets ready to show us his part of the demo, I think there's a question here for you, Jose, from uh, Beyond, uh, who's asking, is there an official Docker image available for Neuron? Uh, not official, but uh, you can very easily create a, a Docker image of Neuron. In fact, we are going to publish that in our knowledge, in our, in our knowledge base. I don't know whether tomorrow or on Friday. Okay, thank so, you. But yeah, you can you can just uh, talk us with your. Okay, David, over to you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so if you go back to the model of what it is that we're building today, you have both the California location that's represented by the uh, the Opto two and two Groove Epic, what Benson showed you. Um, as well as the Madrid plant, which is uh, was all developed in Neuron. So from there, it's all been published into a HiveMQ broker that's running into the cloud. Now it's time for the enterprise MES system. In this case, we're going to be using the uh, Cepasoft to consume some of that data. So much like uh, Benson showed on how you publish the information um, out of Ignition through the transmission module, I'm going to use the, uh, the um, engine module I'm subscribing to the exact same um, endpoint. So there's our HiveMQ broker, um, has the, the, the UNS demo and all of that. And now I'm able to subscribe to all of those tags um, that are published in the broker. So we'll head back over here to Ignition. Uh, and you can see in the MQTT Ignition, I have the California plant, I have the Madrid plant, and I'm now able to consume all of this information. So there is the... Um, the tag namespace that are the edge namespace that's coming right from the broker. So now I'm able to consume this information and start doing some uh, making some manufacturing operations on that. Well, the first thing that I did is that I'm actually going to start creating some different um, namespaces that are going to exist more at the enterprise level. And when Benson was talking about doing some um, UDTs, I've actually created an edge UDT. I can now parse down the specific information that I need in order to um, run my application. So I have my uh, edge namespace. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be simulating a line. And when you're working with OEE, there's some counts that you need, there's some states that you need. And that's what this information is represented here. And I've also created a functional namespace. Um, so this is now that model that is going to do all of my calculation. I'm going to grab my in feed and out feed. So this is in that particular run. Um, that I'll be demonstrating. It calculates OEE, gives you the availability and some performance. Um, and there's a few other metrics that are um, that are, are, are calculated by the OEE engine itself from um, Cephasoft. So now that I have my tag models, I've now created instances of those. And since I'm at the enterprise level, what I'm doing is taking it instead of coming in as California line one for group and nodes, I've now raised it up one level, and this is more of the unified namespace where I'm sitting at the enterprise. I've created instances of these um, those tags. So now you can see in those particular instances, um, I've used a parameter that gives me a tag path. So if for some reason there's a piece of equipment that's antiquated and it doesn't follow the, the, uh, the semantic hierarchy that we want, I do have a little bit of flexibility in terms of uh, making sure that the information is mapping correctly. So this is the instance that I've used now to create my um, enterprise um, California location of line one. So now that Ignition's all set up, I'm consuming the edge namespace. I've configured my uh, the two models that I want to create. I now need to go into Cephasoft and actually start configuring Cephasoft so I can run some production models on this. Before we get going, I think it's important for people to understand the ISA 95. If you're not familiar with that particular standard, uh, Cephasoft has a great website that walks through all of the various pieces. This mostly focuses on the level two. This is all of your um, objects that are used for your uh, manufacturing execution system as 
you look at it from at the business level is what's happening in uh, part two of the uh, ISA 95 standard. Uh, you can see it's a fairly thick document, but uh, it's something that you want to familiarize yourself with. The more you understand ISA 95, the more MES will make sense. So this is the uh, user environment that I have developed within the ignition perspective module that is going to be used to configure my um, um, manufacturing execution system in Cepasoft. So following that ISA 95 standard, I've created my enterprise. I have the, uh, the sites that I'm going to configure. Um, I have the areas that are part of it. And then finally, I get into the lines. The lines is really where all of the action occurs in a manufacturing process. And there are some things that need to get configured as such. Uh, the first thing I need to do is get the counters. And what counters are doing is that how do you actually measure what's coming into the line? That's your in feed what's good product that's coming out that's referred to as the outfeed, and then also what is my reject. Now within Cepasoft, it does have the capability of if you provide two of those values, it'll calculate the third, but in this case, because we have all of those values available, we're capturing it. Um, you'll also notice that the tag path here, that's been hard coded. There actually is a mechanism, it's called equipment path that you can parameterize. So it follows that same tag namespace. Um, but for the uh, instances of this particular demo, I have um, just done that in a, in a hard code fashion. So once you like what you're seeing in here, I need to move the screen over so I can actually get to this arrow. So those are the counters, in feed, out feed, and um, in the reject. I've also done the same thing for the tag path. Now, it's a best practice within in Cepasoft that you let the system do as much of the control as it can. However, if there's things that you want to be able to capture from an edge, like you know, here we have an equipment state, so this is what the, is the actual equipment doing, you can um, assign this a tag value as well. And just looking through this list, there's quite a few things that you can create a, a tag for, so it now becomes more tag-driven um, than an automatic delivery uh, within Cepasoft. Um, you also have to assign a shift. So this is just saying, when is this line available that I can run some production on? And I've also done a, a live analysis. And what the live analysis is, is that at the beginning of the run, that's where I'm going to calculate all of my uh, OEE for that particular uh, work order. And these are the data points that you'll see um, a little bit later is that we're going to get that product code, the work order OEE. Um, you know, th these are just the parameters that can be consumed uh, within the OEE system itself. And then backing out of that, um, we also just, I want to spend a little bit of time on mode and class. So real fast, it's another abstraction that exists within Cepasoft. Mode is what is the equipment supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be in production or am I in maintenance? And that's that uh, informs the overall uh, OEE calculation. And then state, of course, is what's the equipment actually doing. So if I'm in production mode, meaning I'm supposed to be producing, but now I'm in an unplanned downtime state, that's going to negatively impact my availability score. Uh, for that particular case. So now that I've configured the overall hierarchy of the business, so all of my, my equipment within the enterprise, I also need to start creating some materials. So with the, in uh, the ISA 95 standard, and the same here within Cepasoft, you have the idea of a material class, which is beers, and then we also have a material definition. And this is where you just set up the name of the, the material definition is ale, but where can I run ale? Much like the schedule on your line, what kind of, of uh, equipment or what kind of my um, uh, material uh, definitions can be run on a, on a particular line? And then what's that process look like? So looking at my California bottling uh, section, you can see I have line one that's been selected and the, there's some changeover settings. So what changeover does is how much time does it take you to go from running um, you know, manufacturing work order one to manufacturing work order two? And it just defaults to 60 seconds. Um, that's something you're measured against. So that would be the changeover mode. You're not supposed to be producing. And then when you finally are, it's what's the rate period. And there's two uh, parameters that Cepasoft uses. One of them is the schedule rate. So when you're scheduling a production run, it's how much time should you allot for this particular work order? it's going to be less than what your standard rate is because 
The schedule rate is how you schedule your equipment. So it's a lower number. We're going to get out at least a minimum of 60 bottles per minute, but really the line's capable of running 72. You wouldn't want to schedule something that in case there's a downtime event, it gives you a little bit of buffer. Um, I should note that you will be measured against the 72, not the, um, not the 60 number, but that's just for the scheduling purpose itself. And then you also just assign if there's any scales that you need to do. So um, for instance, if you're bringing in beer bottles and you're um, exporting um, cases, that's where you'd have a 12 to 1. So that's where you can start scaling some of your um, outfeed units and that type of thing. So that's just a little bit of uh, getting everything all set up. So now that we have our equipment um, set up, we have our materials set up, and we now know what can run on each particular line, it's time to uh, start bottling some beer. So the MES work order table, this is the manufacturing work orders that the, your ERP system have said, we need to make these. And we're at the enterprise level. And because I've set up both lines and both plants to operate, I can run any one of these work orders at any one of the plants. Uh, commonly, this uh, work order table is going to be populated either through a business connector um, or it's something there's a, a SQL query. Uh, in this case, I've just done it manually. Um, we don't have any of that information. So you can choose what site and what line you want to be on. And we're actually going to schedule some beer or schedule the, uh, the packaging of some beer. So we're going to choose what work order are we going to work on. It tells us what product that we're going to make. This is the operation. And then how much of that we're going to make. And we're going to package up 600 bottles. And now that I have that scheduled, you can see that that's um, showing up on my calendar for when I'm actually going to start making it. And then I can come here and these are some components that are available from Cepasoft. I'm gonna go ahead and begin my OEE run. So now I'm just gonna start that changeover process of uh, making some beer. Um, in order to do that, I'm just gonna come in real fast, make sure that my quantity is set to 600. If you remember earlier in the demo, Benson changed that from 600 uh, down to 12. I'm gonna say, yep, I have that quantity set. Normally, this is something that you would have from an HMI standpoint. You wouldn't come to the, uh, the OE system to do that. I'm now gonna end my changeover. I'm now in production and I'm gonna go ahead and start my line. And if you look over at Benson's screen, you'll notice that it's uh, blinking green. It's uh, actually making product. Yep, indeed. And when you sent down the quantity that showed up on the local operator interface so we know what the run is gonna be. <clears throat> so now that we're in production, you can see that my calendar event moved back. I can see I'm in production. I'm now active on that. So let's take a look at um, what this uh, looks like. So now I have a dashboard that's telling me, okay, um, and I have this defaulted to set up at California um, on bottling line one, but you can see I have a production run of 600. You'll notice that my OE and my performance has dropped. Um, and that's just because we just started the line. This is one of those differences between a SCADA and an OEE. If you refer back to the ISA 95 standard, most of the time your level two data, that's your SCADA data, um, that operates at the second or sub-second level. So you're going to see every time there's a count that passes, um, you're going to see that number going up. But things like an MES, that's more of a minutely type um, application. So in this case, every 60 seconds, uh, Cepasoft is uh, taking a look at what were those counts and then what was my overall performance, what was my availability, what was the quality um, over that last 60 seconds. And you notice that it just did a calculation. Um, it captured 39 bottles that uh, came through. And because it should have had more than that, um, that's where you're starting to see your performance drop off a little bit. So you'll notice here that um, in the OEE namespace, you can now see those exact same values that my ideal count, I should have had 77 that came out in this period and I only got 39. And that's a result of the um, the fact that the line is running a little bit slower. So Benson talked about that potentiometer that he had to increase and slow down um, the speed of that line. And uh, unfortunately, well, it looks like we uh, Benson's already done some rejects in there. So you'll notice that there's some quality um, data that has, um, or that the quality of this uh, production order. Uh, and what that means um, on the quality side is that you had a reject. Something didn't make meet the uh, specification of, um, what it is that was was supposed to be there on it. So the system said, yeah, that's a bad one and it got a reject. So just you know from an understanding of OEE availability is it, it's a maintenance issue. Am I I'm supposed to be running? Am I actually running? Well, we're at 100%. We have not had any downtime events. 
performance gets into it. Hey, I'm making product, um, but is my line running at the speed that it needs to be? Am I producing the number? If you remember, we're supposed to be at 72 bottles a minute and we're running a little bit lower than that. And then finally, quality is, are we making good product? And that's that ratio of you know, how many of the good to how many of the bad. And those numbers are then combined. Uh, for me personally, I like performing or like uh, staying at the APQ level, um, just because OEE seems to be a, you know, I, I know it gets used a lot, but I think the the underlying uh, values are something that's uh, much more, um, much more beneficial. So popping back over here to the engine, you notice that we had the California and Madrid namespaces coming in, all those edge cases. Well, I'm also publishing that enterprise namespace and I've configured another transmission or a transmission or the transmission module and another transmitter to push this out. So you can now see in my uh, line, <coughs> I'm also calculating the uh, overall um, outfeed counts. Sorry, it gets very dry in my basement. And you can see in real time in my unified namespace that I'm getting both a uh, an edge namespace that's part of a, an overall line namespace. I also have a functional namespace. I'm able to view in real time what's running on line one in, in my bottling area of my California plant. What are my overall counts? What's its current state? Um, how is it doing? What's its performance? What's my you know OEE and all that information? Um, you notice that I do have a, round uh, a run time I don't have any unplanned downtime, but the idea here is that within a unified namespace structure, I can very quickly assess what's the overall state of my business, what's the overall health of uh, of the business that's there. Um, you know, one thing I will say from an architecture standpoint, it's it's un it's uh, unusual to have both an edge namespace or a plant namespace publishing into an enterprise along with an enterprise namespace. Um, I generally recommend that you have a site or an area broker that is capturing all of the, uh, the edge namespaces and actually allowing you to produce and then creating a single um, publish of that entire um, site namespace into an enterprise namespace. The idea is that all of these data models that you've created are going to be replicated throughout your enterprise so that we're able to contextually provide the right information at the right time in the right format to the right people. A um, couple of other uh, graphs that I will uh, commonly show um, here. One of them is downtime by occurrence. Uh, you can see we have not had any downtime events. That just means how many times did a particular downtime reason occur? You know, was there a maintenance issue? Was it an electrical issue, mechanical? And then of course, downtime by duration. So when it was down, how long was it down? And this will give you the top five in a Pareto chart. Um, and you can also see some shift performance of, you'll see the top blue line was how much should we have produced? And that bottom line is how many did we produce? And that just gives you a nice uh, you know, view into what's, uh, what's happening. Um, it's gonna take about five minutes for this to run. Um, actually, so Benson, if you wanna speed the line up a little bit and really get that thing uh, going, then we can, we can finish that up. Um, I, I think that's pretty much what I had at this point. So I'm running at 74 bottles a minute right now. There we go. Now we're making some beer. So it looks like it's going to take a little bit longer for this to, uh, to finish up. So I don't know if anybody had any uh, questions at this point. Uh, you know, really, it's the end of the demo. You can see exactly what's, uh, what's occurring in here. You know, just running through the use case again, there's edge namespaces publishing into a broker. You know, here in the enterprise level, I'm able to um, consume that information. I can uh, operate production. Um, I can calculate OEE and I can publish all that information back um, to that broker for consumption by other people. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. So I think there is a, a question here. I think you, you might be the right person to answer that one. So it's from Rick. So he's asking, can you please go over again how the edge data is getting to the UNS and the MES? Sure. Actually, if you can bring your presentation up, um, there's that slide that shows that you have the two um, edge namespaces. So that's the, the demo that both Benson and Jose uh, showed um, is... Let's see, well, there you go, right there. That's that's the architecture that we're following. So there on the left, you can see that there is either the Neuron application or in Benson's case, we're using the Opto, or on the Opto 22, we're running an Ignition Edge. 
that's taking the, uh, the raw tag data that's coming from the PLC. It's putting it into a data model um, that we're using as a line and publishing that information into the HiveMQ broker that's sitting in the cloud. From there, I'm consuming that information and using the MQTT engine, I'm able to utilize those tags to um, operate and control the line. So start production orders and calculate uh, OEE. So it's, it's using the ignition uh, engine or the transmission module or the neuron application to publish using the uh, ignition, the um, engine module to uh, subscribe to that information. And then finally, when I'm done, uh, creating the OEE calculations, I'm publishing that information back in an enterprise namespace, not just as a, a plant or a site namespace. Awesome. Thank you, David. So there are a couple of questions coming in here. So I think maybe before we jump in to address the rest of the, to address the rest of the questions, maybe try to kind of like um, summarize a bit here. I'll, I'll sort of like give you uh, folks like a chance to kind of like give your thoughts on like the whole summary of things. But really for me, the what's so astonishing really about the unified namespace and Sparkplug, like the idea that you could have all this data from multiple geographies, different plants, different systems that talk different protocols into one interface where all the data is in one repository, any system that needs to interact with that data, it finds it in that one place. That's something for me that I really find astonishing really as far as this unified namespace is concerned. And I mean, if any of you uh, in, the, in, in the audience here, if you have experience whatsoever with um, industrial system integration, can you try to imagine what it would take to achieve what we just did with like your traditional protocols? It's, it's months and months and months of work really just trying to get things going. But here it was just like a matter of hours, even just preparing for this demo here, it wasn't really much of a back and forth, just like hours literally just to get all of this data uh, uh, into one unified location. So for me, that's really something that I really find amazing about this technology. So I'll kind of like give you uh, folks a chance also to kind of like give your thoughts as we wrap up. Maybe Benson, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. That's uh, there's there's a lot of our customers are doing exactly what we're doing here. Um, in this particular case, with the use case is to pull all that data that I'm delivering from the edge into the broker uh, into an MES application, but that's not where it stops. The beauty is, is whether I have an MES application or an historian or perhaps a SCADA HMI, whatever, all of those applications are now consuming the same data that I'm producing. So we're not creating one-to-one -one connections between MES and the PLC or SCADA and the PLC and having to deal with all of these multiple connections. Further, I'm not polling the PLC for its information. I'm sending it on change. So all of those applications that subscribe to the data will always get the real-time information. And further, they'll always know the state of the machine. This is a, one of the advantages of, of Sparkplug B is that within that, not only define the topic namespace, but we also have state management there. So we know that that machine is running, even if it's not producing anything. In other words, there's no data change. The system always knows the state. Of the entire uh, of, of the entire enterprise, so those are a couple of, of real key things that uh, is why Sparkplug B running on top of MQTT can make a big impact on your industrial applications. Uh, well, one other note I want to make is in this demo, because we're spread out geographically, we are using a HiveMQ Cloud Edition, but you could also use HiveMQ on prem. So for that in that particular scenario, you might have a local broker at the plant. That's taking care of all of that OT data namespace that uh, David uh, mentioned early on. And then that gets produced up to some other broker where the enterprise namespace can be set up as well. So there's a lot of different configurations here. Storm forwards in there. So in the event I do lose comms to the broker, uh, just as uh, Jose described, I will store and then forward that information when I reconnect. So it's a very resilient system. It's very high performance. Uh, all of those changes happen within uh, milliseconds. And then finally, it's it's absolutely scalable and secure. Uh, and those are key things that uh, are important in any digital transformation uh, uh, exercise is that notion of scalability, cybersecurity, and performance. Thank you. Uh, Jose, you want to give us some closing thoughts? 
Uh, well, um, in my opinion, I think that the unifying space is the right uh, approach to uh, succeed uh, whenever you are um, addressing a new IoT project. Uh, it's uh, it, there. There four elements for me are paramount. It's uh, edge focused. Uh, data must be processed as as close to the source as possible uh, to normalize and uh, standardize everything. Um, using MQTT uh, Spark Plug al um, allows to um, uh, report only relevant changes, uh, so it's very efficient in terms of uh, bandwidth usage. Uh, it's lightweight and um, uh, it's uh, an open architecture. MQTT and Spark Plug are uh, open protocols that are available for everyone. So that's my, that's my opinion. Thank you. David? Yeah, so you were talking earlier about how easy it was to get all of this data out there and how long it would take versus some of the traditional systems that we had used, you know, relative to here. I will say getting the data was the easiest part of this overall um, exercise. It was just getting, you know, the plant model built, building in the uh, material classes and definitions that were associated with that. Um, and then, of course, building the visualization screens. Um, I will say from a data ops standpoint, it's very, very, very important. I could use one more very to make sure that you get your data models created correctly, because the more you start building in these semantic data models, the more difficult it is um, to, to change those in the future. So I would highly encourage people to spend a lot of time really thinking about how do we want to model the data and how do we want to consume all this information? Um, you know, the goal is to connect all of our intelligence into a technology. In this case, it's MQTT with a spark plug um, rather than through applications. So ensure once you start presenting information to the enterprise, it's something that people can readily digest and use it for, you know, all types of applications. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so I think we we can kind of like dive into the Q&A here and try to uh, answer some of the questions. Uh, could I, maybe yeah. uh, before we kick off the Q&A, uh, may I launch the second poll? Yes, I request yes. all attendees to participate. Thank you. Over to you, Kudza, you can continue. I'll keep, I'll keep the polls open. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we've got a question from uh, Ravi S. So he's um, saying, what's the difference between Hive MQ, MQTT broker and normal MQTT broker? Okay, so I guess that's, uh, I can answer that one. So Hive MQ, MQTT broker is a normal broker. So I'm not sure I understand the question, but so Hive MQ really kind of like follows the MQTT specification, which is uh, MQTT 3.1.1. And also uh, MQTT five, so it's uh, compatible with both versions of MQTT. So if that's what you're asking, uh, yes, half MQ is the same as a normal uh, MQTT broker. Um. So Ravi also goes on to ask, how many nodes are required for the broker? How is it calculated initially? So this all depends on your uh, use case. So. We've got our solution engineers who can actually sit down with you and analyze your requirements and see what sort of like uh, uh, infrastructure you need. And then from there, they'll be able to calculate how many nodes you need for your uh, uh, broker based also on the um, uh, the kind of uh, hardware or software that you need uh, uh, to, to, to deploy that uh, broker on. So this is specifically uh, related to what your needs are and what infrastructure you have available to you. Right, and then, okay, let's jump to uh, Sanika. Uh, so he says, I'm a student and still new to this IT OT convention space. So my question might sound very basic, but wanted to ask, how is Hive MQ UNS different from traditional cloud services like GCP or Microsoft Azure? So, yeah, I think I can answer this again. So it goes back to the question that, uh, Ravi asked, right? So in this case, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure, I suppose you're referring to IoT Hub. So this is where there's kind of like a difference between a normal 
MQTT broker, what you'd call a normal MQTT broker, it's something that implements uh, the MQTT specification. So as you'd uh, know, IoT Hub is sort of like a special flavor of MQTT. It's not like a, 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 a doesn't, it's not like a standard uh, MQTT specification that is followed there. Same applies with uh, uh, Google IoT Core, which uh, by the way is uh, getting deprecated, I think in about five months or so from now. So that's kind of like the uh, major difference there. Right, and then we've got uh, a question from Fred. Uh, I don't know, maybe Benson, you wanna take that. Do we know what percentage of manufacturers are adapting digital transformation and industry 4.0? Well, I would uh, argue that it's one of the fastest growing segments in terms of trying to apply these types of technologies to address digital transformation requirements, which of course is transforming your enterprise to a digital enterprise. Uh, and in doing so, you have to do it in a way that is scalable. We've all dealt with point-to-point -point connections uh, our entire careers. I've been doing this for 25 years. And uh, yeah, and there are some other technologies that could potentially help. Um, you know, OPC is obviously one of those. Uh, but because of the way that OPC you know, moves data around, it's very different than the PubSub model of MQTT. Uh, and for that reason, it can be difficult to continue and maintain those systems uh, especially when in a poll response uh, type method. Uh, and that's common what you see in, in OPC. And the, I think the whole idea is uh, part of what we're trying to do from a, a product philosophy is try to reduce the amount of moving parts, right? Try to try to get things consolidated down to where I can capture data, I can model it, and I can get it where it needs to go very, very quickly and easily and in, and with OT tools. There should be no reason to you know develop code or get to the get to the shell to you know start systems up. Try to make it as easy as possible so we can get that data up and start doing something interesting, uh, particularly with uh, achieving those digital transformation goals and becoming a digital enterprise. Um, and then there was, uh, if, if I may, there's another question in there, which Kudzai, you're absolutely qualified to answer. Uh, and that is about uh, HiveMQ Cloud in terms of uh, you know the offer that you guys uh, have presented to uh, our customers and all customers, to be honest. And that is this. Uh, this is a very different way of moving data around. It's a lot more efficient, all the things that we described, but it is new. So a lot of you may be very familiar with this notion of some software scanning a PLC or something like that. This kind of turns that on its head uh, for a lot of the reasons that we've described, security, performance, and so on. And that can be some somewhat difficult to get your head around. And one of the key pieces here is the broker, right? And so what HiveMQ has done is created their HiveMQ Cloud Free Edition. And I love this because as our customers are embracing these new ideas and they want to get a POC up and running quickly, they can sign up for that free cluster, get 100 devices at no charge. And that's amazing because it allows you to actually test all these systems out without any out-of-pocket expense. And then the same with Ignition, Neuron, and others. You've got two-hour free trials to actually put these POCs together and show everything working without a lot of investment uh, and a dollar investment and very little of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. Okay, so uh, the next question, I think maybe, um, uh, Jose, you can answer that one. So Newton Fernandez says, it was said that the data was modeled. What tool was used for modeling? Is it Ignition? No, I don't know what he's referring to, but uh, we use uh, the model is created at the edge, as I said before. So from my side, I created the model in, in Neuron and uh, Benson did the same in, uh, in the Epic using mm -hmm. Ignition in this case. But as, as we said before, it's not necessary to use Ignition. There are other mechanisms available in the in the Epic to do that. Okay, so which means data was modeled using both Neuron and Ignition. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. And then uh, the next one is for you, uh, David. I think you've demonstrated that, but maybe this is an opportunity to kind of like elaborate on that. So the question is, how do you organize the topic namespace using Spark Plug B to accommodate the whole ISA 95 hierarchy so that you can subscribe to any layer from the enterprise level, given that there are only group ID, edge node ID, and device ID available. 
This is a very common topic, very common question that people get. And you know, it's the advantage of, or you know, the powerful thing of, of the string or the flat MQTT is you can publish to any topic. The worst thing about the flat MQTT is you can publish to any topic. So Sparkplug tries to control that through this, this group node ID that must be unique throughout the entire broker. So I mentioned earlier about how I recommend that people have either a plant or an area level um, broker that's sitting at a, at, a, at a location. Because the idea of this group and node ID is that grouping is it's a logical grouping of the devices that are going to be pu publishing to that particular broker. So I'll recommend that people use an area broker and then have either the area line cell as that group node uh, device, or they just use that line and cell, um, depending on what the, the hierarchy or where that broker is being consumed uh, within the enterprise. And that allows you to um, keep those, uh, those systems separate. So you noticed here in this particular demo, we had Neuron that was publishing to a site line um, a namespace, and then I was publishing to an enterprise site namespace. That's where you, at the, a higher level at the enterprise broker, that's where you will then uh, prepend all of that information with the enterprise site. So I consume um, the lower level information, I bring it into and organize it, and then that information is then um, published and presented to the rest of the organization. So it's not something where every one of your group and node IDs can follow the full blown structure. Um, I, I don't think I demonstrated this, but you don't have to start at the very top level um, as you're building out your local tags. You can actually build your transmitter um, to publish from a lower level folder so that its, it's group and node ID is going to be um, unique throughout the entire um, for every device that's going to be publishing to that. So if that's the method that I recommend. Awesome. Okay, so we've got the next one from Doug, Doug Hofer. So that's um, in relation to IFMQ, but uh, if any of the panelists here are able to assist, that would be appreciated. So uh, Doug is asking, can you discuss use of DCS versus PLC relative to IFMQ slash cloud integrations? Anyone wanna? Yeah, so a, a DCS is gonna follow the same or a similar type of uh, structure. So, you know, a very common uh, DCS out there. I mean, so we're talking, you know, uh, Emerson Delta V, the Honeywell Experion. Um, I can't remember the, the Siemens PCS7. Typically they have an endpoint that is available to um, either, you know, Ignition or Neuron, or, you know, there, there's a number of great IoT platforms that'll connect into that particular data. Um, so, you know, similar to a PLC and you're going to have a driver to it, there's just another endpoint that you can get out of a DCS that you can um, you subscribe to, build up a semantic data model, add context um, to it, you know, from the various uh, topics that we've discussed, and then publish it to a broker that mechanism. So really the underlying technology, what's giving us our, our uh, you know, the actual raw, the level one tag values, um, it can be very readily through an, uh, an IoT gateway uh, device publish that information into a UNS. Awesome. Uh, and then the next one is uh, for you, uh, Benson uh, from Anonymous. What is the difference in Opto22 and Raspberry Pi? So I guess it's what's the difference between Opto22 and Raspberry Pi and can not red be used? So I'll take the first one. Um, I'm a huge Raspberry Pi fan uh, and indeed, uh, working with the Raspberry Pi for many, many years is one of the reasons why we decided to build the Groove Epic platform and our Groove Rio on the same notion of a Debian-based Linux operating system. Um, the, the primary issues between the two, aside from cost, obviously, is Raspberry Pis are just not industrial devices. Uh, if you ever take a look at them, load some software on there and watch its performance, as that uh, performance starts to go up, the Raspberry Pi heats up and it starts to declock. Uh, and this is just common. It's just it, it, the purpose of it is you don't want to cook your uh, Raspberry Pi. And so when we've done a lot of these tests and we've run a lot of the same software I run on the Epic on a Pi, that's what we notice. They're really not designed for industrial applications. Uh, the second thing is the memory system. We all know we take a SD card, we shove it into the Raspberry Pi, we load on the uh, OS, whichever one you're choosing to use and uh, you're off to the races, or so it seems. 
you lose power to your you know abrupt power loss to a Raspberry Pi, you're taking a pretty big risk that that Pi will boot back up because of file disk error problems. One of the things we've done with the Epic is made it a power fail uh, file system. And that simply means if I do yank power to my Epic, I'm assured that the system will boot back up. So there's a lot of underlying industrial grade technology, you know, minus 20 to 70 degrees C here, where you're lucky to get to zero to 50 on Pi. Um, that all said, I love Raspberry Pis. They're great tools. Um, but indeed, what we've done is uh, we've got 50 years of experience in building industrial devices that are meant to be put out in the field. And if you have to make a site visit to go fix that thing, you've kind of lost the ROI. So uh, our, our stuff is designed to be very, very bulletproof. And quickly on the second uh, question about Node-RED, indeed, Node-RED is in pre-installed. All the security, all the accounts, everything is uh, is set up on the Groove Epic and Groove Rio uh, to run the Node-RED environment right on the device. And so we've been supporting Node-RED uh, since the very early days, our first Groove device in 2013 came with Node-RED. What would you use Node-RED for? Well, it's kind of the catch-all. So there's a lot of tools, a lot of capabilities within Node-RED around the idea of moving messages around. Could I have done this entire demo with Node-RED? I probably could have. However, it's going to be a little bit more effort. I'm going to be doing a lot of development within the Node-RED environment. And what I tried to show you with the Ignition platform is it's more fill in the blanks. So and rather than doing any you know, JavaScript code, and it, JavaScript's great, but if you don't know JavaScript, you don't want to have to rely on that. Filling in the blanks allows it to be maintained. Uh, you know you have the support of, um, of Ignition in this case, or Neuron, if you're running that on our platform, on, or your choice of Edge platforms. So again, a lot of different tools. Think of it like your smartphone. You know, one of you may be using a, a particular email client on your uh, smartphone. Another may be using a different one or different software altogether. It all comes down to what is the task? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Choose the right tools from a broad toolbox uh, to get that job done uh, in a way that makes sense for your organization. Awesome. Thank you. So we've got uh, another question from Anonymous. So he's asking if. Um, this can be downloaded and watched again. So yes, I think we'll be publishing that uh, on our YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you're going to be sending them a download link, Jayshree, if you've got anything to say there. Okay, so I'll move on to the next one. Uh, Ravi is asking, can you present a node and network architecture of Hive MQ Broker for in-premise installation? Yes, I think we can follow up with this uh, architecture. I think we'll follow up with an email uh, to, to show you this uh, uh, node and network architecture. And then the next uh, question is from Mark uh, to you, Benson. Mark Patout is saying, what steps have Opto22 taken to harden the Groove Epic against DDoS attacks? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, DD, DDoS attacks or denial of service and that's where you absolutely bang on the thing until the until it craters. Uh, we generally, again, that won't happen if you don't have an open firewall port uh, for that outward facing network. And even in this particular case, I do have HTTPS open, so I'm creating an encrypted authenticated connection. But once my system is up and running, I shut down those ports too. So now there's, there's no chance I can get a DDoS uh, um, attack because I'm not listening on anything. I'm literally blocking everything out. Um, but Cybersecurity is uh, constantly changing. There isn't a cybersecurity product that covers everything. Uh, and indeed, and in, as new uh, threats uh, become available, we're always looking to mitigate those uh, those threats. But clearly, authentication, encryption, firewall, uh, those are some of the very early steps that you can take to literally clamp these systems down and prevent outside attacks. Hopefully that was a, a question that I was able to answer for Mark there. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next one is, is not red production ready slash safe to use in production? Benson, you wanna- Can only speak that? from experience. And we have hundreds of customers out there using uh, node red in a production environment. No question about it. Awesome. Okay, so Renz is asking from data regularization, from data regularization point of view, if you go for a Hive MQ cloud on Microsoft Azure, in what region is my data stored? Is there a way to change 
regions. Yeah, so um, if you actually use uh, the templates that we provide for deploying a Hive MQ cluster on Azure, it takes you to your account where you are then able to kind of like uh, configure all the different regions and, and accounts that you want to run this off of. So yes, to answer your question, you're able to change the regions based on what you uh, want your data, where you want your data stored. Okay, so I think that's all the questions that we have on the q and A. I don't know if there's any on the chat. Uh, I'm gonna have to dig through the chat to see if we've got any questions. Otherwise, if not, I think we have uh, addressed all the questions that we had. Yeah, I did notice there was one question about how long the Hive MQ uh, cloud, the free version, how that long that persists. And and mine's still running, so I haven't mine's hit it yet. Still running. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. It's been running for years. <clears throat> Same. Yeah, so it runs as long as you haven't reached the limit of 100 devices. It runs forever. And then once you reach the limit, and then you now need to move to a, a different uh, account. So, all right, I think we've got a lot of questions here uh, regarding Node-RED. Is Node-RED high availability? Um, Node-RED's like every other piece of technology out there. It fits yep. a specific application. So, you know, to say, is it hardened? Is it high availability? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you're losing, you know, if you, I would not use Node-RED for critical compressor shutdown, but if for I sure. just want to trigger a work order, you know, one of the early demos that I did was triggering a work order from a remote piece of equipment of, hey, you need to come change the uh, the filter. That's a great use case for that because, you know, even if something goes south, you're not, you know, you're not uh, putting anybody at risk. So, yeah, and I'll I'll add to that, David. You're you're spot on. You know, the Node Red is a tool, and you want to use it in the right type of application. And generally, where Node Red really excels is the notion of messaging. All Node Red is is passing messages from one node to another and doing something interesting with that. Whether it's sending out uh, data to over a Twilio node to send a text message to you know parsing data from a SQL database very good at that or talking to a web service you know my applications here use uh, web services to find out for example what the spot price of electricity is on uh, Cal ISO and then pull that data in and then perform you know what whether I want to run the turbine or not so there's a lot of different ways it can be used but we always uh, tell our customers you probably should not use this for control and we don't have customers that, that generally do that, particularly real-time critical control. Use the right tool for that. And that's gonna be some control engine, code sys, pack control, uh, whatever you wanna use there. But if you're doing you know, high-speed PID loops, uh, closed system controls, use the right tool, not Node-RED. Cool, and um, there's another one here for you, Jose. So Anonymous is asking for system integrator, do we have to purchase Neuron every time for a new client? Ah, we have a system integrator uh, program available, and there are um, many, many system integrators using Neuron across the across the world. So uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to, to us and, and we will put you in contact with one of those integrators. Okay, thank you so much. So it seems like we've gone through all the questions. I mean, if there's some questions that are left here, we'll be more than happy to kind of like um, get back yeah, to you on that. So there's one more that came in about if you use different versions of Spark plug, um, it it matters not. It, that's that's the beauty of the specification. So you can you know, and I don't think we covered it. Even though we use Spark plug in this, HiveMQ can support three one one and five zero. So you can use just flat MQTT as well as uh, spark plug data. Um, so, you know, kind of going on as a, a, an ancillary answer to that using spark plug and modeling. There are certain things that you can use spark plug for other applications that you use flat MQTT for. And that gives you, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's that, that compliance using spark plug versus the, the flexibility and the innovation of using the, the, the string version as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's Coke Pepsi. What do you want? We got it. Right. Awesome. Okay, so with that, I'd like to say a special thank you to our panelists and thank you so much to the uh, attendees for taking your time out to join us today on this session. I'll uh, uh, bring it over to you, Jeffrey, for any closing remarks. Yeah, sure, sure. 
what a wonderful demo you guys have put together to show us how to implement UNS. Amazing work there, David, Kudzai, Benson, and Jose. Thank you so much. And to all our attendees, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we hope uh, you all enjoyed this workshop. Uh, thanks for all those reactions you are sending in. <laughs> Uh, and if you are interested in learning about UNS, we have released a UNS ebook. I've shared the link in the chat. You can download it. And the slide presentation has links to Opto and Spruik and Neuron uh, uh, links and the contact details of uh, Jose, David, as well as Benson. You feel free to reach out to us. And like I already said at the beginning of the session, we will share the recording as well as the presentation over the follow-up email. So you uh, can have a look at it uh, later as well. Feel free to forward it to all your colleagues. I know many of you have been asking. Uh, so do check it out. Um, thanks again for tuning in. And thanks to all the panelists here. Thank it you. was a really great session. Right. I learned Thank a you, lot. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.